It's my pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, Michael Hatcher. I told him this morning I was going to give him a really good introduction because it's probably going to be the nicest thing anything said about him this week. <laughs> you know, there are several identifying marks of a good and honest heart and a good preacher and a stalwart of the truth. Uh, Michael, unfortunately, at this point is wearing most of his identifying marks on his face. <clears throat> But I, I look to Michael and men like him, and I really appreciate them so much more than uh, I did even years ago as they stand solidly on the corner of truth. Currently, uh, Michael, as most of you know, is uh, married to the f former Karen Savage out of T Trenton, Texas. So you did marry a Texan. That's, a, I guess, a good thing for him. Um, and he's currently uh, preaching at uh, uh, Bellevue Church of Christ in Pensacola, Florida. But the main thing, the most important thing about Michael, as I said earlier, is that uh, he has stood for the truth. I've come to appreciate him. And I tell you, you could do a lot worse for a role model and somebody willing to take a stand for the truth and, and let the chips fall where they may. And uh, since 2005, I looked to Mike, Michael and men like him and Dub and, and Dave and some others, and I really appreciate their example to all of us. So I would certainly encourage our young men to look to these men as people, examples of people who, uh, when uh, you, sometimes you have a choice, you want to keep your situation or make it better, or do you want to stand with the truth? And uh, Michael is certainly one of those, and I appreciate him and love him for it. Uh, Michael, come and speak to us. He's, Mike's going to be speaking to us. Christ confronted religious traditions. I appreciate that, and that probably is the nicest thing that uh, will be said about me all week, so <laughs> the rest of it will probably be true. <laughs> it's an honor to be here, to be asked to speak on this lectureship. It's always a joy and a privilege to be with the good brethren here. And to be mentioned and the same breath as some of the men that Brother Jack mentioned is even a greater honor. We've all heard the statements and talking about a certain subject. Uh, a lot of times uh, it's uh, the subject of the sin of using instrumental music in worship to God. Well, that's just your tradition. Well, in a sense, yes, that's true. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But um, when you look at the word tradition itself, it simply means that which has been handed down. That's the meaning of the word. What has been handed down is not intrinsic in the word, nor who handed it down is intrinsic in the word. It simply means that which has been handed down. And so you have to look at the source of traditions. And when you look at the source of traditions, even as you look at authority and as Jesus set forth in Matthew 21, verse 23 and following, that authority for actions come from either God or man. The same is true with that which has been handed down. It's going to either come from God or it's going to come from man. We see the traditions of God in passages, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11 in verse 2, that Paul was encouraging the Corinthians to keep the, King James has ordinances, the American Standard and New King James has traditions as I have delivered unto them. Question is, what had Paul delivered unto them? He says, as I have delivered them unto you, what had he delivered unto them? Well, if you go back to chapter 2 and verses 7 through 13, it's that which the Holy Spirit had given unto him as an apostle of Jesus Christ, that he spoke those words that the Spirit was giving to him the Spirit searching the deep things of God so that he could 
speak those deep things of God and that which God has revealed unto us. And if you go over in the 14th chapter, in verse 37, he says that if any man thinking himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So when we look at what had Paul delivered unto them, it was that which the Spirit had revealed and that he thus spoke. That, by the way, would be oral traditions from God. That which he wrote, chapter 14, which would be the scriptures, are thus the written traditions from God. That which he handed down as directed by the Spirit to the Corinthians. And now then he encourages them, you keep those traditions. Why? Because the origin of those traditions are from God. We would see it in... Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, and again in chapter 3 and verse 6, the terms are used. Uh, and Paul writes in chapter 2 and verse 15 of 2 Thessalonians, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. And chapter 3 and verse 6, he goes on, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. That last phrase, the tradition which he received of us, goes back to chapter 2 and verse 15, the traditions that ye have been taught, or which ye have been taught. What Paul was teaching, that you see in chapter 2 and verse 15, is that which the Thessalonians had received, chapter 3 and verse 6. They are the same. What had he been teaching? Well, go back to chapter 2 and verse 15 and look at the context. There were some who were disturbed there at Thessalonica that the return of the Lord was imminent. Sounds like some today, doesn't it? And so, Paul sets forth that there's a man of sin, the son of perdition, has to be revealed prior to this return of the Lord. And that there's going to be a falling away that takes place. But in verse 10, he says that that man of sin would deceive. That he's going to come with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's what that man of sin, the son of perdition, would be presenting and would deceive these individuals because, why? They love not, what? The truth. That truth that saves. Paul then makes a change at this point. Or actually, uh, he goes on to say that God's going to send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Why? Because they don't love the truth. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now then he makes a change. From those who do not love the truth, and thus who, those who are going to be damned, those who don't obey the truth, to those who do. And in verse 13, you see that. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. I don't have time to go into detail, but look at that by the Spirit. What is that? That's what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 and following. That which the Spirit has revealed and which Paul taught both orally, and he wrote down in the letters. And then he says, you've been called by the gospel. The gospel is God's word. And that's verse 14. You've been called by the gospel to the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's individuals who have obeyed the gospel. They've obeyed the truth, that which the Spirit has revealed. What? They were baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins based upon their faith, repentance, confession. And now then, what are they to do? Well, they are to stand fast and hold the traditions that have been taught, that which God has handed down by revelation to them, that which the 
the apostles spoke and that which they wrote, that's what they are to keep. And God calls those the traditions. That is, that which has been handed down by God. If we want to attain heaven's home, we must obey those traditions. And so when someone says in regards to bringing in a mechanical instrument of music, well, it's just your tradition. Well, that's right. We got it from God in Ephesians 5 and verse 19 and Colossians 3, 16 and other passages such as that that we sing. That's the authority that God gave us. That's his tradition. And to change and alter that tradition, man has not the right. And when they do, they're going to be lost. Yes, they will go to hell for using a mechanical instrument of music and worship to God today. Now, it's that simple. Why? Because they're not following the traditions. They're not standing fast in the traditions that have been taught. But we also find that there are traditions of man. And in this, we start seeing that there are two categories of traditions of men. One category is that which God has not authorized. And then, of course, the other is going to be that which God has authorized. But when we get over into that which God has not authorized, see a good illustration of that in Romans 1st chapter when Paul talks about the Gentile world and what they were involved in. We see it in Galatians the fifth chapter when he talks about the works of the flesh. Uh, we see it in the list of sins that the Corinthians were involved in in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 and 10. But in becoming a Christian, they had to stop those things. Remember verse 11, and such were some of you, but you're washed, you're justified, uh, you're sanctified. What? You did live that way. You lived according to those traditions of men that were unauthorized by God. But now then, you've changed. You've been converted to Christ. So there's a difference. Those are things that God has not authorized. They will always be wrong. They're sinful. But also false doctrine falls into this category. In Colossians 2 and verse 8, Paul says to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. The tradition of men that he mentions here is probably an early form of Gnosticism. We're not going to go into a study of Gnosticism, although that would be a profitable study. But look at that word spoil. Beware lest any man spoil you. The word spoil, as defined by Zohidus, is figuratively of the destructive effects of false teachers who rob believers of the complete riches available in Christ and revealed in the gospel. That's a, as good of a, maybe an application of that word spoil as anyone could get that it is the destructive effects of false teachers. Right? When any false doctrine is taught, it has destructive effects. It's going to bring men into a bondage of sin. It's going to rob them of the riches that are available in Christ Jesus. Uh, in the book I mentioned, uh, the previous books that were here in the lectureship, Premillennialism, Calvinism, Pentecostalism, false doctrines. You can look at the denominations of men today, uh, false doctrines as a result, and has brought about those denominational groups. Uh, you can deal with, and when we get into this area, you could get into so many different areas the uh, false doctrines about God. False doctrines about salvation, false doctrines about the church, false doctrines about the scheme of redemption, false doctrine about the work of the church, the worship of the church, the organization of the church. Just about anything that you want to talk about in relationship to the church of our Lord or spiritual matters, there's false doctrines that are available anywhere and everywhere about it. 
And when those false doctrines are believed by individuals, those individuals are robbed of the riches of Christianity. Spoiled by those traditions of men that are unauthorized by God, false doctrine. But sadly, those false doctrines that are in the world, those false traditions that are unauthorized by God as far as morals and everything else that you want to deal with, they sadly make their way into the Lord's church. I don't think that there is anything that you can find in the world that you cannot find in some form or fashion within the Lord's church. Yes, false doctrine and the, it's error and they've gone astray and all of that, but we're just talking about from the standpoint of those congregations that have been associated with the church and have drifted away because of false doctrine. And those congregations that are led astray by those false doctrines and those false practices, they're lost. And unless they repent, they're going to go to hell. Sadly, you know, brethren, why in the world would we want to fellowship those individuals as a result and be tainted by the false doctrine that they are involved in? And yet... We see that in one form or another in so many congregations today. Doesn't make sense, does it? Because if they've spoiled that congregation and we start fellowshipping them and we start promoting what they do by mentioning those things in the bulletin or we publish articles by those individuals who have spoiled congregations, what's that going to do to us? If it's robbed those congregations of the joys of Christianity and that which the blessings that can be found therein, if it's robbed that congregation of those things and we start promoting it and endorsing them, what's going to happen to us? Isn't it the case that error creeps in slowly among people? It's been mentioned through the years that Satan or does not come into a congregation or a false teacher doesn't come into a congregation wearing a red suit and uh, carrying a pitchfork with a long tail and saying, Hey, I'm a false teacher. I'm going to lead you astray. So, no, he doesn't do that. He comes in slowly and it looks just like someone who is faithful servant of God, who's humble and pious, and he starts slowly working his wares into where years down the road you won't even recognize it any longer. And by our endorsement and our fellowship of those who have been spoiled by the philosophies of man, by the false doctrines of men, when we do those things, we're going to be spoiled as well. Maybe not immediately, but down the road we will be. But then we also come into that category of traditions that are authorized by God, but are not obligatory matters. They are not required. And when we study Matthew, the 15th chapter, and its parallel passages, and specifically verses 1 through 9, we start seeing some of these things uh, a little clearer. The scribes and Pharisees mention to Jesus, Why are your disciples transgressing the tradition of the elders and that they wash not their hands before they eat? 
Let me ask you the question, is it an expedient matter, is it advantageous for us today to wash our hands before we eat? Now most of us, so maybe some young boys who, you know, will go out and eat dirt and things like that growing up, uh, most of us are going to say, yes, it, it's profitable, it's good, it's expedient. In fact, don't parents with their children, as they call them to come eat, say, go wash your hands first? Why? Because we know that it's a good thing to do. It is a good tradition for us to follow. There's nothing wrong with that tradition itself. In fact, we should follow it. Not that we always do, but we should. And we recognize that we should. And so we start learning that there are traditions that are handed down that come from men. And let's add there are traditions from the religious world as well that are good and profitable. Some of them, though, need to be discarded. They're old, worn out. Each generation, each location must determine for itself if those human traditions that are optional in nature are advantageous or not. We all know that technology changes probably a whole lot faster than we can keep up with it. And as we get older, that becomes even more difficult and the technolo technological changes are so fast that even those who are keep trying to keep up with it can't do it. Society changes. Our attitudes about things change. And as a result, here's traditions that might have been really good at one time that are no longer all that advantageous. Now you just use an illustration. How many of uh, you remember the sheet charts that you, preachers used to use? Yeah. There's a lot of you that do, because you're old enough to. Some of these younger kids have no concept as to what you're talking about when you talk about sheet chart sermons. Why? Because the technology has changed. And so we started using overhead projectors. And guess what? Those overhead projectors, the technology of that is so old now that people don't even consider them. And so now then we have the data projectors. Technology has changed. The older technology sometimes needs to be discarded for the newer technology. What is that? That's traditions that are no longer advantageous because of the society that we are in and the technological changes that we see. Another illustration, mass media. You know, at one time, radio was the thing. And now, radio is not much of anything. It changed to television. Well, Radio is still profitable and can be, but it doesn't have the effect that later technology has. All we're saying is, look at what's advantageous. Be willing to discard the old and accept the new. Those are changes that we must be willing to make. And what's going to work now, a hundred years from now, when we're all dead in the grave, might not work then if the Lord allows this old world to continue. So 
traditions in one country might be far different than traditions in another country. And I see uh, Ken Chumley back there, who's still uh, more English than American. <laughs> because he sees both traditions, the English and the American. And what might work here in America might not work in England. What works in England might not work here. These are things that are optional in nature. They are traditions, yes, that have been handed down, but they are optional. They're not sinful in themselves. They can be discarded. But, don't you know there's always but? There are cases where those traditions that are optional in nature become sinful. We see a couple of areas here in Matthew, the 15th chapter. The first of those is that the Pharisees had made this man-made optional tradition, that is the washing of hands before you eat, a mandatory matter. We might call it they had bound something that God had not bound. You know, sometimes those who try to stick with God's word were called Pharisees and Pharisaical. No, because we're not trying to bind things that God has not bound. We're called that by those who want to loose where God is bound. We're not trying to bind things that God is not bound. But some have. And those really would be pharisaical. These Pharisees that came to Jesus with this statement were in effect saying, your disciples are in sin. They are committing sin because they did not wash their hands before they ate. Now, was that the case? No. They violated a tradition of man that was optional in nature, even though that optional human tradition was advantageous. But when they elevated it to the status of God's word, they committed sin. It's interesting in looking at these oral traditions that basically they had elevated the oral traditions above that of God's word. Do we know any religious organizations that do that today? If you don't think so, look at the Catholic Church. And you have God's word here and you have the papal bulls, the oral traditions, they become more important than what God's word actually says. Same thing with the Pharisees. You see, they thought that the oral law possessed greater sanctity than the written law. And so the oral law, those oral traditions, were more important than what God's word actually said. They considered the oral law the perfection of the written. And the one who followed the oral traditions were wiser and holier than those individuals who simply followed the written word of God. Now, that's hard for us to grasp because we don't think that way generally. But that was the viewpoint of these individuals. We've seen those type of attitudes, though, take place within the Lord's church as well. And it's wrong. It's sinful. And thus we see that when we 
elevate an optional matter to a mandatory matter, then it's sinful. But then there's also the other area in which we see these optional human traditions that become sinful is when we allow those traditions to cause us to fail to do what God's word tells us to do. Another of their traditions that Jesus uses here, it's recorded in Mark's account in chapter 7 and verse 11. Ye say, here's their tradition in other words. Ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mayest be profited by me, he shall be free. God's command was very clear, to honor your father and mother. He that curseth father and mother shall surely be put to death. That's Exodus 20 and verse 12 along with Exodus 21 and verse 17. But what was happening? Well, here's the parents. They get into a need, financial. They're in poverty. They need something. And the children would say, Corbin. This has been dedicated, it has been set aside as a gift to God. And thus, according to their Jewish tradition, those resources could not be used for anyone else, including the parents. Now, and the interesting thing is, they didn't really have to turn those things over to God. Not until they died, at least. And so while they were alive, they could continue to use and maybe use up all of that which is, had been turned over to God. But they could not take it and use it for anyone else, including their parents. They taught that the gift superseded anything else. Now, I mentioned in the book a couple of positive traditions from this. I'll just mention them here, the aspect of giving. You know, it's a, a good tradition to give as we have been prospered, give to God as we have been prospered. But then if you look at the Old Testament, there were those mandatory offerings, but then there were free will offerings that were totally voluntary. Look at the Macedonians who, in their deep poverty, gave not what was expected, but they went way beyond that to where they pleaded with Paul, take the gift. We need more Macedonians in the church today. It's a positive tradition, turning something over to God. But also... Another positive tradition was the binding nature of vows. They recognized, you say this is Corbin, it is turned over to God. Binding nature of vows. And certainly God expected them to pay their vows in the Old Testament. Although by the time of Jesus they were not respecting those things and those vows. You can see uh, Jesus' condemnation of them in Matthew 23rd chapter. They respected the form of the vow more than the vow itself. As long as it was said in the proper format, they had to abide by it. If they could get around it by using a different form of vow, then they didn't have to. So they didn't really respect the vow itself, but you do see that principle along this line. And we need to learn today, God expects us to keep that which we say. But they were not. They were taking that and just saying, we don't have to take care of our parents because of it. Jesus quotes the law of Moses, and it's interesting that he makes application, a proper application of what the law actually said in honoring your father and mother. And he takes that and he applies it to taking care of them. 
not just obeying them. Obeying them when you're growing up, but when they get older, there's a taking care of them. That's honoring your parents. And what we do, we turn it over to the state today. But that's another matter. And so the Jews were then allowing, or the Pharisees were allowing them, their children, to violate God's command by simply saying, it's Corbin. It's turned over to God. So even those traditions that are optional in nature that are advantageous can be made to be sin. Now Jesus mentions three things that come from making God's commandment of none effect by the traditions. One, verse 3 of Matthew 15, they transgress God's command. Two, they become a hypocrite, verse 8. And verse 9, it makes their worship vain or worthless, of no value. So when we look at traditions, yes, we have traditions. Let's admit it. We have to determine, are those traditions from God? That is, are they authorized by God's word as something that we must do? Or do they come from man? And if they are from man, man's traditions, are they simply things that are unauthorized by God and thus always sinful? Or are they authorized by God then we have to determine whether they are advantageous or not. And then we have to make sure that we do not elevate those traditions to God's word, nor do we allow them to cause us to violate what God has clearly set forth within his word. And when we look at that, then we can start seeing a totally different viewpoint of traditions. And we see how Jesus viewed those traditions. And then we start studying and learning what truly is God's word and what is truly just a tradition of man. Thank you for your attention. I hope these things will be a benefit to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, give us five minutes. Can you still head back? <laughs> Uh, preach, pardon? That's, okay, Gene, Gene will take those for you. Traditions. What's wrong with old sheep sermon, sermons? You didn't have to worry about a bulb going out. You didn't have to have power, uh, you yeah. know, to light it up. You might have had, needed the power, though, to be able to see. It. Well, but you got, I mean, I'm, for, for the sheet itself, you didn't require power. It's certainly cheaper than a projector, and a lot cheaper than a, a digital projector and a, and a laptop. Uh, it didn't probably take any longer to put together than it did the, the presentation that you do on the digital projector. Well, maybe. Okay. But uh, it certainly traveled easier. Didn't have to worry about dropping it, I guess, like, unless you dropped it in the water or something. But. <laughs> traditions. I appreciate that, Michael. Uh, we do have traditions, and we're going to talk about some of those traditions right now. Traditionally, we have a, a break between uh, the uh, speakers, and we're going to have one of those. And we think that's a good thing, and I can't find anything in the Bible that says it's not authorized, uh, that we can't do that. So we're going to do that. Uh, there will be some uh, snacks between the, the, the meetings. Certainly lunch will be provided every day to, to Thursday through Sunday, so be sure and, and um, uh, uh, if you can. Um, uh, join us there if you don't want to go out and get into the traffic outside or if it's raining getting into the rain and the traffic but the light refreshments will be available during the, uh, between the lectures so we'll uh, don't forget the lectureship uh, books I mean that are in the back and also the other displays so if you have a need of a, a book or something just be sure and, and look at those uh, they're in the fellowship building as they uh, typically are traditionally are and uh, and remember uh, if you have to leave or something, we are live. I've, I checked again this morning. So if you want to view the uh, lectures uh, from uh, the comfort of your home, if you have to leave, then certainly uh, please uh, go to churcheschrist.com and follow the links you can get there. Uh, that's all. Just remember to don't, uh, be sure not to park in front of the trash receptacle outside. I don't know what day they come, but it's hard for them to get to if you're parked in front of it. So do not park in front of that. And again, as we mentioned, for security reasons be sure to lock your cars and keep uh, th any valuables out of sight or locked in the trunk or whatever so i guess we'll uh, now um
uh, be dismissed until the, the top of the hour.